Hi, this is Matt Marchant, and welcome to the virtual class for Becoming Friends with Anger. I would like to congratulate you on being angry enough to take this class. Or should I really say, on being aware enough to take this class. But thank you for joining me, and uh, you should have your manual. We will be covering all the material in the manual. This will be about a two-hour lecture unless I just keep rambling, which means it could be anywhere from three to four hours in length. But in all seriousness, this should be about a two-hour lecture, and uh, go ahead and grab your notes and your manual if you're ready. So uh, the theme for this class, if I can project a theme onto it, would be this. Um, to acknowledge our anger and to respect ourselves enough to own it. That's the theme for me going into this class. The two learning objectives that I have are this. Uh, one, discover our behavioral patterns with anger and learn to respond to them. And two, understand where our beliefs originate about anger and then create a new way of viewing anger. So for me, those two learning objecti objectives are very important. Discovering my uh, behavioral pattern with anger and then getting a greater or deeper understanding on the beliefs that could be as we'll talk about maybe later in the uh, class, the beliefs could be affecting my behavior. And could it be true that behavior is just a symptom of beliefs? So we're going to look at two parts. We'll look at the behavior, but we're also going to look at the beliefs as well. So with that, let's get into section one. What is anger? Now, the first question that I'd like to ask is this. Why in the world would we want to become friends with anger? Why title a class on anger like that, becoming friends with anger, well, isn't anger bad? I mean, haven't we seen anger cause so much turmoil uh, for families, for society, for cultures? A war started over anger. Why in the world would we want to become friends with anger? So my question is this. Could it be true that when we become friends with anything, that thing, that person, uh, will more than likely start to work on our behalf and work with us? And could that be true with anger? Uh, could it also be true that whatever we resist in life will persist in life? So if we continue to resist our own anger, could it be true that it's just going to persist? And maybe we need to not deny our anger any longer, but at the same side, not just be enslaved to our anger. Could there be a happy medium? I believe there is, and I believe that's what's called becoming friends with anger. So welcome to the class. So, before we um, discuss maybe some definitions of what anger is, here are some interesting questions so that you may find out what you believe about anger. We'll go into some definitions about anger, but really, definitions taken out of a book or definitions that either I've put on anger or someone else has put on anger doesn't really reflect what you think anger is and what you believe anger to be. That's what's really important. What is your belief about anger? So, first question is, what beliefs have you created about anger? Would you list three? So here in the manual, I give you some space, uh, if you'd like to, write down, what are some beliefs that I have about anger? I gave an example. Anger should not be expressed. So that could be one belief that someone has about anger, like, well, you know what? Anger is just not good. You shouldn't really express that. And whatever the belief is, Try not to judge it too much and just put it down, whatever it is, whatever my belief about anger is. So you can take time to do that. You can pause the video if you like. Write those three things down. Next question, after we write those three things down, what feelings do you have about those beliefs towards anger? So now that we've written down three possible beliefs, how do those beliefs make you feel? When you look at it and you read it, what does it make you feel? An example would be, I'm looking at that and that belief makes me frustrated or that belief makes me really confused or that belief makes me afraid. Uh, there could be many things uh, that you're feeling when you look at that belief. And I find that a lot of times when I write these things down, meaning I write down the belief as opposed to just keeping it in my head, I'm able to decode it a lot more and understand it a lot more. So if you'd like to take time to do that as well, feel free to take the time to do that. The last question in this series of looking at our, uh, our, 
our real beliefs about anger would be what consequences have you created for each belief listed? So going back to that first one, you have that belief. What are the consequences to that? Consequences could be a, a positive consequence, a negative consequence. It doesn't matter. But what do you believe is a consequence to that? For example, if we're following suit with that first example I gave you, if someone doesn't express anger somehow, they may blow up at some point. So we can see right here that my, my example belief is, well, anger shouldn't be expressed. And the feeling might be, I, I feel confused by that. I shouldn't express it, but it's inside of me. What would be a consequence of that? Well, a consequence could be if I don't express it somehow, I'm going to explode. So you see how there's a, a conflict here. The belief says, do not express your anger. You're feeling confused by it, but you can acknowledge a consequence to that belief is you're going to blow up at some point. And so it, it's interesting to look at these. And once you've written two or three, um, the, the next question would be this. Look at the list above, and does there seem to be a theme? What theme do you see with these beliefs, with these feelings towards the beliefs, and with the consequences uh, to those beliefs? If you see a theme, I left a space for you to write that out. Um, if there seems to be no theme, if you're looking at that and go, wow, this doesn't really look to have a theme at all, could this be true? Uh, might it be true that you understand your anger enough, but you're confused by it? So could it be that all these things you're written, you, you've, you've written down, you go, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I understand it enough that I'm watching this program, I'm in this class, I've maybe done some other reading on anger, and I, I know I have some anger issues, so I understand it enough, but I'm really confused by it. Could that be a theme? I know that's a theme for me, is that I can understand it and go, yes, I'm angry, and I see that behavior, but I can be very confused by it. Um, and that's why I'm here in this class along with you. So would you be interested in learning how to change not just your behavior towards anger, but also the beliefs surrounding it? And that's what we're going to get into. In section two, we're going to look at the behavior of anger. In section three, we're going to look at the belief of anger. So that's just starting off with um, what is anger? So again, I'm going to ask the question, could it be true that belief, that behavior, sorry, could it be true that behavior is a symptom of belief. I find that to be true for me. I wonder how uh, you would answer that question and I'm wondering if you're, you're interested and willing to explore that question more in detail when we get deeper in into section two and then on to section three. So let's go through next the myths of anger. Now I could have listed a lot here. These are just a few that I've come up with. I would encourage you to even write down your own list. I found this to be actually very refreshing to write some of these things down and go, yeah, that just doesn't seem right, but that's what I was either told, I learned, or for some reason I just kind of, I don't know, just it seemed like, yeah, that's true, but then when I wrote it down, I kind of saw some flaws to how I was uh, viewing anger, and it's helped me to change my own view towards anger. So number one, A, what I consider to be a myth is that anger is bad. Now let me ask you a question. Is being happy bad? Is being sad bad? Is being disappointed bad? Would it be right to, to place a, a judgment on these emotions as either good or bad? Isn't that a bit too black and white to go, well, it's, it's good here and, and, and it just means it's good all the time or it's, it's bad and it's bad all the time. Wouldn't it be more appropriate just to say that feelings and emotions, they just are and it's just something we're experiencing and maybe if we can step out of labeling them and not label them good or bad, we have a better opportunity to understand them and just experience them for what they are and see more of the message that's trying to be communicated to us through the feeling. Could it be that these emotions are like signs on the road and they're just giving us a signal on our journey? So could there be a positive side and a negative side to each emotion? This is sometimes called a light and shadow side in uh, psychology. I think there could be. There's times when it's great to be happy. There's other times it might not be so great to be happy, right? Same with a lot of things. We could use that example for a lot of things. So going back to the myth, I don't believe that anger is bad. I'm curious what you uh, 
think about that and how you feel about that. But I'm wondering if instead of labeling anger as bad and, and, and then instead just saying anger is just anger, just like happy is happy, sad is sad, and maybe not label it and just step out and observe it. So that's myth number one. Myth number two, some people never get angry or mad. I think that's a really interesting one. Um, if you've taken the class I, I did on self-sabotage, I asked the same question. What percentage of people sabotage themselves at some point in some area in life and at some time in life? Uh, my guess would be 101%. I don't know how you get that 1% extra, but 101%. I would say the same thing is true of anger. I would say it's probably 102%. Um, everybody experiences anger. Um, there's probably a, a bit of people, a, a percentage of people that might be uh, in denial towards that anger or they just don't understand that their behavior is actually anger. It's just more passive anger and we're gonna look at that really quickly. So when it comes to that, even uh, some religious figures, if you read religious text or see people's lives, uh, they get angry too. So for someone to say, oh, I just don't get angry or mad or for us to go, well, this person, my grandma, she never gets angry or mad. Mm could be uh, I don't think so for me but I'll, I'll leave that up to you to consider that so my question though is this if someone is claiming or if someone really believes that they or this other person is not able to get angry they don't just don't do it could they be denying their humanity isn't it human to have feelings if someone never got happy says I just never get happy I never get sad wouldn't you just uh, go, wow, that just is a bit odd. You're just kind of like a robot. So it would make sense if someone's saying, oh, I just never get happy, I never get sad, that the, they, they're kind of losing their, their touch with humanity. I would say the same thing would be true with anger. If we say, oh, I never get angry, I think we're losing touch with our human nature. And it's just human nature to experience things. And again, as I hope that we will be able to learn later in this lesson, uh, it's okay to be angry. It's how we respond to it as opposed to react to it. So, number C, another myth of anger is being angry means that you yell and scream. So here's another myth. Oh, well, you know what? Uh, just go on. <sighs> Whatever. That's not anger. <laughs> if I put my fist through a wall, scream and yell, throw something across the room, well, that's definitely anger. Um, I think that's a myth too. There is a broad spectrum of anger. There is what's called passive anger and active anger. And I wrote a little list here on the page. Uh, the passive anger is what's called passive aggressive and the active anger is what's called aggressive and projected. So passive anger implodes, active anger explodes, passive anger is silent. Think about giving someone the silent treatment. That's anger. It's just silent and passive or dismissive, yeah, whatever, hmm, whatever. I believe that to be anger too. Whereas the opposite, and that's, that's passive, the active in, instead of being silent and dismissive, you just yell or you're physical. You yell, scream, you throw something across the room. I believe that can be just as angry of a reaction, yelling and screaming, as being silent and dismissive. And hopefully um, you'll see that perhaps as we go into this lesson a bit deeper. So. Passive anger is sarcastic, whereas active would be direct insults. Passive anger could be just a blank stare, whereas active could be uh, rage. So we're going to skip to the very back of the manual. I believe it's the third from the last page. We're going to look at Appendix A. Now, I, there's a lot of information in Appendix A here. I just want to cover it briefly. I believe it's the third to the last page, Appendix A. It says the, says the extremes of anger, passive and aggressive. Let's just quickly go through passive. What is passive aggressive anger? Passive aggressive anger is a method of expression by which one attempts to hurt or provoke others to obtain revenge while acting as though one is not angry. Now this came out of a uh, therapy book. So this definition is, is pretty wordy. What if we could say this? Passive aggressive anger is this, being angry but pretending that we are not. That's probably a little bit better definition, makes a bit more sense to me than everything I wrote down there. But let's go with that. 
So passive aggressive anger is I'm angry, but I'm going to pretend to you and even pretend to myself that I'm not really angry. And so here's some types of passive aggressive anger. You can look through that list. There's mild, moderate, and severe. And you might be as surprised as I am when you look through that and go, oh, I think I do that. Yeah, and I, I do that and that and that. Wow. I wonder if I have a bit more anger than I first thought. I wonder if that's true for you as you look through this list. Skipping down to the aggressive, okay? So we have passive aggressive anger. This is one end of the spectrum. And let's say the other end of the spectrum is rage, full on rage, okay? So uh, I'm gonna skip down a little bit and just give one of these definitions of rage here. It says rage is excessive anger, whether sudden or seething, while for a little while, the individual acts as someone different than themselves. So, the easy definition of rage, it's excessive anger. It comes on like that, or it can build. It can be sudden or seething. And for this point in time, this person is acting like someone else than who they really are. They're this person, most of the time we'll say, and during this raise, they're acting as someone else. Uh, you can look through um, all the different characteristics of rage. There's blind rage, total rage, sudden rage, seething rage. Um, very interesting stuff here. Um, and again, this came, this came straight out of a book. I put this information in here. Uh, it, it's too much to cover in this class, but I wanted you to have access to learning this material. So if you skip down, we're going to the next page now. It says C, sudden rage. Uh, I just want to talk about sudden rage and seething rage because you could take out that word rage and just put anger because some of you might be going, whoa, I never, I never experienced rage like that. Okay, well, let's take out the word rage and let's put in anger. Uh, it's my opinion that sudden anger is typically triggered by feeling threatened, whatever that means to you, feeling threatened. So if you skip down the bottom of that page where it says what triggers rage. Um, there's fear-based and shame-based. This could be true. You could put, you could scratch out the word rage and put what triggers anger, fear or shame could be a trigger of it. And let's take a look at number one, fear for safety. So what could trigger a sudden kind of, um, a sudden anger? Well, I'm, I'm afraid for my safety. I am not physically or emotionally safe right now. So I could be walking down the street and some some guys jump out in front of me, what happens? <gasps> I'm starting to get angry. I'm feeling uh, not safe physically. Well, the same could be happening emotionally. What happens if I'm sitting here in my office, I feel calm and someone walks over and starts yelling at me. <gasps> I can have a sudden response of anger. That can be a trigger. The second trigger to uh, sudden anger or sudden rage, I believe would be the fear of impotence. The fear of impotence would say something like this. I am not able to make any change to my current situation. And for that, I'm pretty angry. So here I am. I can't get out of here. I'm stuck in a corner, whether literally, physically in a corner, or emotionally, I feel I'm in a corner. I can't make a decision. Okay? And a lot of times, this fear of impotence comes about in work-related situations, in my experience, and family-related situations where we go, oh, I just can't make a decision. I, I can't say no. I can't get out of here. I can't do anything. And that can make us angry. Okay? The shame-based would be the shame of humiliation that I am, what that says is I'm flawed or I'm bad. As opposed to what I did, it's that I am. And so that could be uh, someone says something that humiliates me and it triggers a response to me that suddenly I just get angry. Could be that. Or the shame of abandonment. I feel like someone's leaving. And I've experienced that before and that was very painful and all of a sudden I get angry. You come home and the person in your life says, I'm out of here. <gasps> you could be driving home, you know, just be having a great happy day and all of a sudden that fear of abandonment, boom, or the, I should say the shame of abandonment because the shame is really saying, I'm not enough to keep you here. So the shame of abandonment uh, triggers that sudden anger. So anyways, you can read through that. Skipping down to C on seething anger uh, typically is triggered by resentment 
And resentment, in my opinion, is typically a response from doing things out of obligation. So in the class, I handed out some notes from a previous class that talked about loyalty versus respect. It's my opinion that the difference between loyalty and respect is this. Loyalty is doing something out of a sense of obligation. Respect is doing something out of a, out of a sense of acknowledgement. So my question is this. If we're loyal to somebody, aren't we just doing something out of obligation? Well, I'm loyal. I'll, I'm going to do this for you, and you'll do this for me. As opposed to if I do something out of respect, I'm just going to do this because I acknowledge you. I'm not attached to what I get in return. So my next question is this. If obligation, or here's my question, can obligation produce anything other than resentment? So if I'm doing something out of obligation to anybody, to a friend, to a spouse, for a child, anything, can it produce anything other than resentment? I haven't found uh, anything else that obligation can produce other than resentment for me. I would uh, encourage you to uh, dive into that question and see if that might be true for you or maybe there could be something else that uh, could be caused by obligation other than resentment. So sudden, typically I'm threatened, seething, I'm doing something out of obligation. So let's go back to our, our original page here. We're back on the second page. We're still in the myths. Let's look at uh, D, myth D. Others can make me angry. So if others could make us angry, why wouldn't they make us do other things as well? So if I could make you angry, if I had that much power, that I could make you angry, why would I want to do that? And why would I want to do that all the time? I personally don't like being around angry people. So why would I want to make you angry? If you're in my life, why would I want to, I would purposefully try to do that? No, I would try to make you happy and at peace so I can deal with someone who's happy and at peace, not with someone who's angry. So could it be true that we, we are really responsible for our own feelings and no one else is responsible? And that goes back to the theme of this class of learning how to own our own anger. So how disempowering is it to acknowledge or to consider that someone else can make us angry. So if I go, yeah, you on the other side of that camera there, yeah, you have the power to make me angry, happy, and all of a sudden, I'm just a puppet, just kind of moving around. Whatever you want me to feel, you're in charge, I'm not. Even just saying those words makes me feel pretty uh, disempowered. Oh gosh, I'm not in control of much. Well, what am I in control of? Man. I better be careful then who, who I'm around because if people around me can trigger feelings and emotions, I feel very vulnerable. Oh, what's going on? I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that people can make us angry. I believe that it's empowering to take on this belief. I'm in control of what I create within me. And I take responsibility for that which I create. So. If I want to create happiness, anger, sadness, anything, I'm in control of it. And if and when I do, I take responsibility for it and go, yep, I'm angry. You didn't make me angry. I'm angry at how I'm experiencing you, how I'm experiencing the situation. But you as a person cannot make me angry. I choose to be. And so that gives me back my power. And we'll look, a, look into that a bit deeper when we look into how to fight fair, meaning how to deal with uh, someone giving us a criticism or complaint. So E, uh, another myth. If I either express or suppress my anger, it will automatically go away. So if I express it, it goes away. Well, if that was true, uh, anytime you come home and yell and scream and kick a hole in the door, your anger should be gone. I mean, it should, you shouldn't have anger anymore. Now, you might have a temporary relief of anger. It's like taking a little Advil for the headache. But the root cause of the headache is still there. Whatever caused the headache, you didn't get down that deep. 
You just took something that kind of numbed out the headache. So yeah, an expression can give you the sense of relief, but there is definitely no sense of healing. And so expressing does not necessarily mean that the anger is going to go away. And we'll see that when we get into the difference between expressing anger and processing anger. And next, uh, suppressing anger. So a quick definition. Suppression is where I consciously say, I am angry right now and I'm going to stuff it. I'm aware that I'm angry and I'm stuffing it. Repressed anger, that's su suppressed. Repressed anger is I stuffed it and I'm unaware of it. I've got some anger from a long time ago that I'm not really aware of that I stuffed it. I'm not sure why it's in there. I know certain things trigger me. I'm not sure why the same person, uh, whenever he or she does this, it kind of triggers me. I'm not sure what's going on with that. Um, that's probably more repressed. It's deeper down there from a long time ago, whether it's suppressed is, I know why this person makes me angry. I'm going to stuff it right now because I don't know how to deal with it. So it's my view that uh, when we suppress anger and when it's repressed, it's not being processed and we're not really healing. Again, it may, may give us a sense of relief, but there's a big difference between relief and really healing. Again, like taking an Advil for a headache gives you relief, but what's really going on in the brain and giving you the headache or going on in the body has not been addressed. Uh, it's like they say, um, a headache does not mean that you are deficient in aspirin. <laughs> so taking the aspirin, it's, it's not that the brain needs an aspirin. Oh, I just haven't had an aspirin today. That's why I have a headache. No, the aspirin just kind of numbs it out and, and quote unquote takes it away but uh, there's a deeper cause of the headache. Same would be true in my guess when it comes to anger. So let's go through what anger is. Now let's go through some quote unquote official definitions of anger. And uh, what is anger? And a lot of these are coming out of uh, books and that kind of stuff, but it gives us an idea. And, and I'm offering you four possible definitions. Please, by all means, uh, create your own definition on what anger means to you so you have a better grasp on it, okay? Here's four that we can kind of look at and consider. Anger is an expressed reaction to not feeling safe, valued, or in control. Anger is expressed when a part of us has an important need that it feels is not being acknowledged. So when I have something important and I want some other person to acknowledge it and I don't get acknowledged, I get angry. I think this is important. So, here's my question. Do people yell or act out their anger if they feel heard? If I feel like you're listening to me right now, and I feel like I have an important need or want, or just some point that I want to make, and I'm just looking for you to acknowledge me, do I have a need to raise my voice and yell and scream if you're just being present and being, hmm, okay, and acknowledging me? No, I probably would just be like, well... Oh, well, thanks for listening. Here's, uh, yeah, here's what I, I wanted to say. I would say that when people yell or act out their anger, it's because they do not feel like they're being heard. So, interesting point there. It's a reaction to not feeling safe, valued, or in control. So whenever I don't feel safe, whenever I don't feel valued, whenever I don't feel in control of a situation, it's a, it's a reaction to that feeling. And we're going to get deeper into uh, what that means, feeling safe and feeling valued in a little bit. Uh, number two, possible definition of anger. It is a strong feeling of displeasure because we are unable to feel pleasure. All organisms want to move away from pain and towards pleasure. So when I feel like I am moving towards pain and I cannot move towards pleasure, I get angry. So. Anger can arise out of our unmet expectations. And as we may discover, uh, we talked a, a, about it a bit in the, uh, the live class, the difference between attachment, detachment, and non-attachment. And I'll just briefly describe those. Those deal with expectations. When I'm attached to something, that means I'm attached to the outcome. Okay? I need this to happen. This has to happen this way. When I'm detached, it means I don't care about anything. I am apathetic. And that, in my opinion, wouldn't be ideal either. 
It wouldn't be ideal to be attached. I have to, it has to work out this way. Oh my gosh, if it doesn't work out this way, I'm, uh, I'm gonna get anxious and angry and ugh. But the opposite is, I don't care. I don't care if the bills get paid. I don't care if I show up to work. I don't care if you leave. Yeah, whatever. I don't see that as being optimal either. I see that those two being extremes of being very, very suboptimal. What might be more optimal is what's called non-attachment. Now, non-attachment does not mean I do not have expectations, that I walk around like, I don't care if you do this to me. I don't care. I don't care. It means that we are not invested in the outcome, but we are invested in the process of what's going on. So we can still have reasonable expectations of ourselves and others, but we are not attached to those outcomes. And a lot more can be said on those. I'm just giving a brief kind of, really brief introduction on attached, detached, and non-attached. But consider those as possible explanations uh, towards having an expectation. Because a lot of times, what is anger? I'm mad because I had an expectation that wasn't met. Well, what if I could learn to not be attached, not be detached, but I could learn to be non-attached? Interesting. And uh, by the way, <laughs> learning that difference, it, it, it's a process. It might be a lifelong process. This is not something that you, in my opinion, you read a book and all of a sudden, hey, I'm not attached, man. It's a, it's a work in progress. So how does attachment to the outcome set us up for potential failure? I find that to be another interesting question. Uh, number three on definition of anger. Not knowing how to handle your own suffering. It's my opinion that to suffer is to be human. You will suffer at some point. You will have some pain at some point. If you don't, you may be living in la-la land, right? Everyone's going to go through some suffering. When our suffering is not allowed to matter or have meaning, anger is produced. This is absolutely true for me. Absolutely true for me. If I'm suffering, all humans suffer. If it doesn't matter, if I deny it, oh, I'm not suffering. Everyone in my life just left me. My business collapsed. My health is going down the toilet. Oh, but... I'm not suffering at all. Everything is, <laughs> it's just great. Um, I'm denying my suffering, and there is going to be some interesting consequences for me. I'm not sure if that's true for you, but it's definitely true for me. Um, my suffering needs to matter, which means I have to acknowledge it, can't deny it, and I, I find it important to give my suffering meaning. This means this. I might not know what that meaning is, but I'm curious enough to find out what that meaning might be. So it might go something like this. I'm suffering right now. I'm going to acknowledge that. And I'm going to acknowledge that there's some meaning behind this. There's some purpose behind this. There's some reason behind this. I have no clue why I'm suffering. But you know what? I'm curious enough to um, investigate it and find out. When I start doing that, I find that sense of anger... Uh, decrease a lot more. When I'm not allowing my suffering to matter or have meaning, I get mad. And I would, I would think others might feel the same way. So, last definition of anger is love turned inside out. So, if, if, if we're going to continue with that definition, let's first define what love is. Love is, in my opinion, a very ambiguous term. What in the world does love mean? You see it everywhere. I love, love, love. It could mean a uh, hundred things to 50 different people. Okay, to, It could mean a hundred things to one person, right? I mean, love is, it's, uh, we throw words around a lot. If I can just kind of go, go off of the notes here. We throw words around a lot that, in my opinion, we have no clue what they mean. Absolutely no clue. But we use them a lot in society. We use them a lot in relationships. We have no clue what they mean in general, let alone what they mean to us. But we've just gotten so familiar to use these words, and any word that is not thoroughly understood, it's my opinion that word has become dead. It's a dead word. It is a car with no gas in it. It, it, it has no functionality to it. If your car doesn't move, well, what are you going to do with it? it? That's what it's designed to do, to move. So, love may best be defined as acknowledgement and respect. So, inside out love, this love turned inside out, 
So if, let me backtrack. So if love is best defined as acknowledgement and respect, then love turned inside out may then be defined as being ignored and disrespected. So love is, I'm being acknowledged and respected. Inside out love is I'm being ignored and disrespected. So wouldn't that make you pretty angry if you were ignored and disrespected? Well, yeah. So going back to this fourth definition, anger is love turned inside out. So why do we use anger? It gives us the illusion of control or power. That would be, uh, and again, these are just three possible reasons on why we use anger. I invite you to come up with your own reasons on why uh, we use anger in general or why you personally use anger. Here are three uh, things I am offering you to consider. So number one, it gives us the illusion, and that's a key word for me, illusion of control or power. We get our way when we get angry. So have we learned that we get our own way when we get angry? Ha! Ah, if I get angry enough, if I yell and scream enough, ugh, I get my way. I'm in control. If I get sarcastic enough, if I get passive enough, if I give you the silent treatment, which is a really passive aggressive anger, I get my way. And so it gives us this sense of control. Yes. Why do I use anger? Because it makes me feel powerful and in control. Why wouldn't I use anger? I think that's a, a real reason for me on why I use my anger. It gives me uh, the illusion. I don't really have power in that sense, but in that moment, it tricks me into thinking that I do. Number two possible reason why we use anger. It deflects us from other primary emotions. It's my opinion that anger is a secondary emotion and as we'll find out later, it's secondary to the emotions of shame and fear. So I use anger to deflect from shame and fear because shame and fear are pretty deep, pretty heavy, and they come from fairly, usually, fairly painful parts of us and painful times in our life. That's not always easy to look at, the shame and fear in our life. So. Rather than deal with shame and fear, 